Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on stolen land. We're on the land of the Wiradjuri people, uh, and it's my great honour to be here today on the land of the oldest living storytellers, storytelling culture in the world. I want to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, we're going to have a great conversation today with our three guests, uh, and we're also going to have a Q&A towards the end, so start getting your thinking caps on and thinking of questions to ask. And then, of course, we're going to have book sales and signings afterwards, so if you have any other questions, you can keep them till then. So now to introduce our wonderful guests. Um, on my direct left here, we have Eliza Hull who is a musical artist, a writer, a journalist, and a disability advocate, and a contributor to the anthology Growing Up Disabled in Australia. Eliza's podcast series on parenting with a disability, We've Got This, was one of Radio National's and ABC Life's most successful of all time. And that series ultimately transformed into a book, also called We've Got This, Stories by Disabled Parents, which came out with Black Ink earlier this year, and it's just incredible. I highly recommend it. And um, Eliza is also the co-author with Sally Rippon of the children's book, Come Over to My House, which we'll be talking about today. So please make Eliza very welcome. Next in the middle, we've got Gabrielle Wang, who's the Australian Children's Laureate for 2022-23. She's an author and illustrator born in Melbourne of Chinese heritage. Her maternal great-grandfather came to Victoria during the gold rush and her father was from Shanghai. Her stories are a blend of Chinese and Western culture with a touch of fantasy. Gabrielle has been publishing since 2002 and is the author of many, many award-winning books for children and young adults. And her latest books include Ting Ting, the Ghost Hunter, and Zadie Ma and the Dog Who Chased the Moon. Please make Gabrielle very welcome. Thank you. And then finally down the end, we have Gary Lonesborough, who's an award-winning Ewan writer who grew up on the far south coast of New South Wales as part of a loud, large and proud Aboriginal family. Gabrielle, sorry, Gary has worked in Aboriginal health, child protection and the disability sector and in the film industry, including in the feature film adaption of Jasper Jones. His, yeah, <laughs> very cool. His debut YA novel, The Boy from the Mish, was published by Alan and Unwin in February 2001 and has just recently come out in the US as Ready When You Are. Um, this book has just been an absolute hit, um, so beloved by readers, and has been shortlisted for numerous awards and won the Booktopia Fab Award for Favourite Debut Book. So please make Gary very welcome. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you all about, you know, issues in the publishing industry, where it's going, how we can make it better. But I'm conscious that you're all here on this panel because you're all wonderful authors of individual books. So before we kind of dive into those bigger issues, I wanted to give you each a chance to kind of just briefly introduce your book for audience members who haven't encountered your writing before. So Eliza, okay. would you like to go first? Yeah. So my name is Eliza Hull and um, I have a disability. So I've got a physical disability that I've had since I was five years old and it affects the way that I, I walk. Uh, and when I was growing up, I felt so underrepresented. And I remember, you know, looking through various picture books and not seeing a person with disability. So I realised that there really needs to be change in this space. That is why I wrote Come Over to My House. It's a book that is for that representation, for children and families to see themselves represented in a book. But what I'm probably even more excited about, if, if I can be, I mean, I'm pretty excited about that, but I'm also very excited that 
this will reach families that might not have experienced disability, might not even know a person with disability, uh, because it, it, it represents all different families. And right at the back, it also has uh, ways that we can talk about disability with our children and conversation starters around disability. I think when I do a lot of speaking and a lot of parents put their hand up and say, how do I talk about disability? And so this really was a way to make these conversations happen in the home and to reduce the stigma of disabled people out in society. Thanks so much, Eliza. Um, Gabrielle, could you introduce us to Zadie Ma? Yeah, OK. Um, so Zadie Ma is basically a love letter to my first dog, um, who I called Rusty. And in the front of the book, there's a photograph of myself and my grandfather and Rusty. And um, my grandfather, the thing that I wanted, there were two things that I wanted the most in the world when I was really young. The first thing was to be white, because there was so much racial prejudice around. There still is. The second thing was to have a dog. <laughs> and so I, um, my, great, my grandfather worked at the Victoria Market selling fruit and vegetables in Melbourne, and he found this lost dog wandering around, and he knew how much I wanted a dog. He brought him home, and he gave him to me. And I loved Rusty um, for 10 years. So I was nine years old, loved him and loved him for 10 years, slept on my bed, we did everything together. And then one day, I was 19, I went away with a boyfriend of, you know, holidaying, and my parents took Rusty and my younger brother and sister to the beach to a holiday house, and he wandered away, and we never saw him again. And he got lost. And, you know, even though I'm this age, and it happened so long ago, there was no closure for that, and I knew that one day I would write a novel. I love dogs. I would write a novel about a dog, uh, about Rusty, but I knew it was going to be really hard to do because I... It brings back so many memories, because I never knew what happened to him. You know, did he find another family to love him? Did he get taken to the pound and get put down? Did he have a family that was cruel to him? All these thoughts went through my mind. And um, so I wrote this book um, as a, a love letter to my dog. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, um, it's, a, it's a different book than any other book I've written, because um, the main narrative is um, Zadie Ma's story her journey, but then there's also, from the point of view of the dog, Jupiter, there's a, um, a graphic novel, two graphic novel sections, uh, and then there are short stories, because Zadie loves to write, uh, she's a dreamer, uh, she loves to write stories, and some of the stories that she writes come true. So um, it's a very different novel, short stories, which are fable-like, graphic novel, and this overarching story. Great, thank you. <laughs> and I must confess, I, I um, recently got my own dog for the first time, Gabrielle, and I read it with read your wonderful book with my dog curled up on my lap, oh. and I was feeling very loved up in a dog oh. space. <laughs> it was very lovely, and I quite miss my dog today yeah. back in Melbourne. Um, and Gary, would you like to introduce the boy from the Mish to us? Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, my book, The Boy from the Mish, uh, which came out in 2021, <laughs> not 2001, because oh, I, <laughs> I was six years old. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's about a 17-year-old Aboriginal boy named Jackson who's uh, grown up in a small Aboriginal village in rural New South Wales. Um, and yeah, so it's the start of the summer holidays and Jackson's auntie and little cousins are coming to visit for Christmas, well, just like they do every year. Uh, but this year, Jackson's auntie has brought with her another Aboriginal boy who's the same age as Jackson, um, named Thomas, um, who's fresh out of juvie and who she's acting as a foster carer for. And yeah, the story is really about just Jackson and Thomas's relationship and, and their friendship. And and you know, as they become closer, Jackson, you know, begins to, uh, I guess, dawn on Jackson that he's he's gay and that he is falling in love with Thomas and. And the story is really about him, you know, taking that journey to accepting who he is and loving who he is and yeah. allowing himself to, to feel that love that he is feeling. Um, and it's very much inspired by my own kind of teen years uh, growing up as a 
closeted gay kid in Bega. Um, all the, all the, I guess I just wanted to articulate how I felt when I was a teenager and, and yeah, really put into words what that was like for me uh, through Jackson in the book. Um, but yeah, that, that, that story was really, uh, yeah, I guess, a, a message of hope to my 17-year-old self. Um, yeah, that's, that's what the book's about. Yeah, yeah, thank you yeah. so much. And it's... <laughs> And it's an abs yeah, absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. Um, I don't normally read a huge amount of YA, but I read it last year before I knew I was going to be doing this panel because everyone I knew was raving about The Boy from the Mish and what a yeah, stunning book it is. Um, so you've each kind of alluded to this already, but I wanted to kind of go back into talking about your sort of origin stories as writers. Like, how did you each become writers and why did you decide to write for children or young people specifically? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, as a young person, I would write lots of stories. Yeah, it yeah. was a form of escapism for me. Um, but all, I'm also a singer, a songwriter. So I write music for, under my own name, Eliza Hull, but I also write for TV and film. Uh, and again, music and songwriting and, and, you know, being a lyricist was a, just a way for me to escape and, and untangle all the feelings that I had. Uh, and I remember at school there were times when I was bullied because of um, the way that I, I walk. And so that, again, was that way just to kind of go to the library, spend time writing, go to the music room, sit at the piano and write. So I guess that's where it really came from for, for me as a way of expressing myself and, and a form of escapism. The reason... And then I guess it's just developed as time has gone. I've written, you know, I'm a journalist and written for the ABC a lot. And then um, wrote, you know, We've Got This, and that became an anthology of other writers. And for me, the reason behind We've Got This was just that lack of representation of when I was wanting to become a parent. Uh, I f there was nothing out there that was a kind of, I guess, a tool book for me to know yeah. what it was going to be like to be a parent with disability. The reason that I chose to write for kids is because children are the future and um, my hope is that, I mean, I base my life on the, you know, the social model of disability, which is that the world is disabling, um, you know, stairs are, you know, really, really hard for me. I, if there's no railing, I, I can't get up them. So I guess that if there's, you know, not a ramp, then, then I'm more disabled in that environment. So it's actually looking at the way that we can change the world instead of trying to fix the person. Uh, and that's what I really want to show in, in this book in Come Over to My House, is that we don't need to um, change people. We don't need to fix disability. We don't need to see it as a deficit or something that is to be feared, but to show kids that diversity is what makes this world truly beautiful. And I think these, these families in this book show that so much because they're great people to know, they're fun, it's a very colourful book, uh, and it shows ways that these families are creative and problem solvers and adapt in their environment. Key. And what about you, Gabrielle? How did you become a writer? Um, well, I, I, unlike most authors, who loved to write since they were kids, uh, I had no idea that I could write. I, was, I loved to draw. I've drawn all my life since I can remember. Um, I was really bad at school, at schoolwork. I loved art and I loved sport. But um, I did really badly at school. I was not academic at all. And um, did year 12, but failed year 12, um, all of the subjects. And I had to repeat it again because I wanted to, do, to go to RMIT and do art. I did graphic design and you needed year 12 to go to RMIT. So I did it again, repeated it, passed it finally. Um, and it wasn't until many, many, many years later. I was a graphic designer for a long time. I went and found my own roots by going to China because I had no, never been to China. I couldn't speak Chinese. Um, I thought, you know, maybe this would make me a more whole person if I found out my own heritage. So I lived in Taiwan for five years and China for two years, came back sort of being proud of who I was rather than when I was a child and trying to reject and hating this face 
and you know how it was so different from everybody else. Um, and it, was, it wasn't until my children were in, um, when they were like eight and ten years old, so I was you know quite old by then. I um, knew that there was something coming. I felt three months before I discovered that I could write. I felt this train, this big freight train coming towards me, like I was in a station. This train was coming towards me, and I was going to discover something incredible, like post-it notes, something like that. <laughs> that would make me rich, right? Um, so every night I'd go to sleep, and I'd go, in the morning, I'm going to wake up thinking about, you know, having dreamt about what I was going to discover. So um, one particular night, I actually had a dream, and I won't tell the dream because it will take too long, but it was a very prophetic dream and it was about a Chinese dragon. And when I woke up, because it was so sharp and so clear, and I think dreams are a way of your subconscious telling you what to do or you know something else telling you what to do, um, I wrote the dream down. As I wrote it, it started to become a story. And I was so amazed, because I'd never written anything before. I'd only written angst-ridden poetry in year nine, you know, when a boyfriend <laughs> dumped me, as we all did. But apart from that, I was just thought I was a hopeless writer. And I was so impressed with my writing, this short story by the end of the day. And so I put it away. I didn't know what to do with it. Sorry, it's a really long, a little bit of a... No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I was always interested in doing picture books, because I like illustrating. So the following year, this was nine, in 2000, I decided to take one subject in the writing and editing course at TAFE, and it was taken. It was given by Hazel Edwards, who wrote "There's a Hippopotamus on My Roof Eating Cake," a wonderful teacher, wonderful author. And so, the first semester was taken up using uh, doing picture books, telling us how to write picture books and how to present them to a publisher. Second semester, she said, um, "We're going to write a, a junior novel," and I thought, "Uh, uh." That's not me, I can't write. So I said to Hazel, I'm not going to come back. I've got what I wanted, thank you very much. And I went home and I thought, you know, this is a real challenge and the only way we can get better at anything, it, and especially when the opportunity comes by, and whether you, you know, I was really, really scared to do it, but I, I thought, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do this, there are other six months, even though all the other people are right, you know, professional writer, doing a professional course. And so I did, and by the end of those six months, because I took that story I had out of the bo my bottom drawer, end of the six months I had a whole novel, and Hazel said this is good enough to be published. And so I sent it off to many places on her, you know, she contacted them all first. Eventually it got published. I had nine, six, six or seven um, rejections, but this is, the, this is the book that finally got published. So, um, yeah, it's about inclusion, belonging, what is home, all the things that I felt when I was a child. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Yeah. I love that. And I love that it's another um, author who didn't write when I was growing up. Really much oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. I always yeah. feel like all, all these authors say, oh, I was scribbling yes, away stories oh, no. when I was three years old. And I was like, oh, that wasn't me at all. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, good. What about you, Gary? What was your journey into writing? Well, I was scribbling away. Oh, <laughs> no, get out. Get yeah. Out. Um, uh, yeah, like I was probably six or seven. Um, I just loved reading and yeah. like, my parents always had books around the house. and uh, So I used to make these little stories and like cut pieces of A4 paper in half and staple them together to make little books. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess there's like a few different moments that kind of led me to being a writer. Uh, one was in year three when I, I had this Canadian teacher um, who was on exchange at our school and she got us to write short stories for Halloween. Um, so I wrote mine about this school camp that, and me and my friends were all the main characters. And uh, we go on the school camp and get attacked by like werewolves and zombies and <laughs> mummies. And uh, all my friends died in horrible ways. Um, <laughs> And my teacher got me to read it in front of the class and everyone was just like rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> um, and yeah, like that was kind of the first moment when I thought, oh yeah, maybe I'm actually a good writer and, um, and I can make people like feel something when, with my writing. And, um, and in year six, my teacher, I guess she saw that I had this kind of creative uh, talent and she got me to do these little writing classes outside of class with a different teacher. Um, where we'd just go off and do like little writing exercises and writing games. Um, and yeah, I got a story published in the, the interview school magazine in year six um, 
from doing those classes. Um, and then, yeah, I really kind of fell out of love with reading and writing in high school until uh, it would have been year 11. I uh, wrote this short story uh, in an English class. We were doing, like, a writing exercise. And a couple of months later, this writing competition popped up, which was the Patrick White Young Indigenous Writers Award. Uh, so I, I remember that I had that story that I really liked, so I just sent that in. Um, and then I won that competition in the Year 12 category and won a $500 gift card for Coles, uh, which is every kid's dream. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, so that, I remember that moment winning that competition being like, oh, okay, like, I've always loved writing and, like, I'm going to be a writer one day. Yeah. Um, and so I really kind of focused on, on, you know, reading more and writing a lot more, um, you know, over the next few years after that. Um, yeah, and I just, I've always loved writing and, um, yeah, it's just been something that I've always kind of wanted. I just always wanted to be an author because um, I really admired authors. I thought they were, like, superheroes. And, um, yeah, I really looked up to them. Yeah. And uh, why I write YA, uh, I think that's just because those are the stories that I love reading. Uh, yeah. I love reading you know, stories about growing up and about you know, discovering who you are and, and, and you know, moving into adulthood, like you know, those kind of big moments in life, um, going from a child to an adult. Um, yeah, those are the stories I like to read, so just naturally they the stories I love to write. And um, I think the, you know, the writing style that, that's really common in YA is very much my style. So, yeah, it just kind of works. Yeah, so that was just a natural <laughs> yeah, thing for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you all for sharing those stories. Um, I wanted to sort of ask now about, I suppose, the question of how you write hard stuff for kids. Um, this just really fascinates me as someone who doesn't write for kids. I mean, you're, what's wonderful about all your work is that, you know, you tackle complicated, messy realities of life things like, you know, racism, ableism, homophobia, and do it in ways that are, you know, accessible for children and young people. How do you go about kind of, I suppose, doing, doing the hard stuff and making it real, but also kind of making it age appropriate? Hmm. Does anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> Sorry, it's a whole question. It's a, it's a big question. It I, is. For me, I just, yeah, the only thing I can think of around that is just that with this particular book, um, it was a conscious decision to actually have the children mm. coming from the children's voice. Yeah. Um, just to, again, make it really inviting. Like yeah. the, ch the child is speaking to the child. So it, it says, come over to my house, come over to play. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we'll speak about the, the parent or the child with a disability, but in a way that, again, is just like you're talking to a friend. Yeah. And I think that that was purposeful because I wanted it to re feel very welcoming and like that, you know, you were just popping into somebody's house and getting to know that family. Um, but also in the in the notes at the end for the for the children, um, again, I, I just feel like sometimes it's good, it's really great just to be honest, yeah, to yeah. actually have the hard conversations. So right at the end, I'm speaking to the child and I introduce myself, um, and I just say it how it is. I say that disability is not a bad word. Yeah, yeah. That disability is not something to be scared of, and just saying it really honestly. I think that. It's important that we have these big and hard conversations in the home because often uh, children are just such kind beings, really, aren't, aren't they? Innocent. And if we are, if we have these conversations and we educate our, our kids, I find that in society they then become more inclusive. And I think that it's better, you know, a lot of parents when they, a child wants to say, you know, what, what happened to, to you or why do you walk like that, often parents tell the child to be quiet or shh, mm -hmm. don't, look, don't look. And for me, I feel like that actually creates more stigma because yeah. it's like don't interact with that person. Um, whereas if we actually just have the hard conversations and tackle the, the, the subject around things that might be really hard, yeah. then we're actually doing kids... A service, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So we have a kind of cultural norm around yeah. shielding kids from hard things, but we should actually just tell it to them straight. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Hmm. What do you um, think about? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. You yeah. need to be upfront and honest. And I, um, the only time I hold back 
is when, um, when I have to include, um, if there was a racist person in the book, um, I don't include what they say mm. because it's reinforcing, you know, they don't say chink or yeah, yeah. slant eyes or, you know, because it's reinforcing to the kids. Yep. I mean, because you go around, I go around Australia and I still get called that yeah. uh, by kids and not only kids, but um, <laughs> by people who should know better. Um, and so the, that's the thing that I hold back on only. Uh, I mean, I'd like to put it in, but the, but the children who read it wouldn't understand the um, yeah, yeah. the impact of it, or although I do put in um, in the, in Zadie Ma, uh, set in 1955, and um, there was a lot of I mean, as there has been all the way through waves of racial prejudice against Asians, um, because of the, the Japanese War, a lot of um, Chinese were considered were looked upon as Japanese, and so in the book. Um, there is a, um, a moment where um, the kids are ordered out of the house uh, because the father can't stand to be in the same room with Asian, even though they're not Japanese, and the Japanese invaded China and did so many horrible things. He just can't stand because he was from a prisoner, you know, prisoner of war camp. And he uses, you know, it's, I mean, I use the word yellow, yellow peril in here, which dates back to Gold Rush. So... Um, you know, there's times where I sort of put it in, but I, if it's really a harsh word, I will never, or a terrible racist word, I won't include it. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great approach. How did you approach this question, Gary? Like, did you just sort of feel like you just told it straight, or did you kind of hold back on certain areas? Yeah, no, I've told it pretty straight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think with YA, you yeah, do have you, that... Um, yeah. Like, it is expected that, you know... There are certain things in terms of content that, mm. that are very natural for, like, teenage life. Um, like, there's a lot of swearing and, mm. um, you know, a lot of sex and a lot of uh, underage drinking. And, and, like, all those things are just, you know, they are what teenagers do. Um, so it's, you know, I think most importantly it's about, you know, telling the truth and being authentic um, and, you know, accepting that those things are part of life for teenagers. Um, but in terms of the actual content... Uh, I definitely, definitely do have an Aboriginal slur in, in my book, um, but there is also a moment later on. Um, oh, sorry, and then like because the reason I really wanted to put that in was to articulate how that feels to be called that as an Aboriginal person, and and um, yeah, so yeah, so it's, it's the truth, and uh, I think that's kind of expected in YA. Um, but yeah, again, there's another scene later on where. Um, a character says the same word, and uh, Jackson takes a minute to kind of educate that guy. Yeah, um, yeah. Not in a way that's ramming a message down the reader's throat, but just in a moment of uh, explanation uh, where he says, that that's actually like a really bad word to be saying. Um, and, yeah, that, that kid doesn't know that, that that's what... He, that's the message he was giving when he was saying it, um, which is often the case, I find, with a lot of, uh, a lot of my encounters with people who are saying racist things is that they're just very uh, unaware and ignorant. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, in terms of content, um, I like to... I think it's important in YA to keep it all about the emotional... Uh, the emotional journey in those moments. Mm. Um, you know, obviously there's no graphic sex scenes yeah. in, in YA... In, yeah, in young adult literature, but uh, that doesn't mean the sex doesn't happen. Um, yeah. It's just all about honing in on the emotional... Uh, yeah, the emotional journey in those moments, and and yeah, really keeping it about that, and rather than you know descriptive um, graphic language, it's yeah more about the emotion and and yeah, just telling the truth. Um, yeah, I don't think there was much. I did have to cut a few c words from the book, but um, <laughs> that, was, that was fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, teenagers say the c word like. There's not, it's nothing that's... Well, exactly. Yeah. It's not like, you know, yeah, yeah. teenagers are doing all the things you're writing yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, so there are... Yeah, there are moments where you do have to kind of just remember that... Uh, yeah, like, you, you are writing for young adults, so you don't want to be too... Uh, I, I mean, I definitely feel like there are... As a teenager, you're kind of... You're not, you think your life is terrible or really hard at the time, but you don't know what the real world is like yet um, in a lot of ways, um, so... Yeah, just, I guess, yeah, just keeping about the emotions and being authentic. Um, it's kind of the approach I took. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, without, yeah, yeah, just pushing those boundaries a little bit in YA, I think is really important as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, Gabrielle, I wanted to ask you about your current role as the Australian Children's Laureate. Um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, what that entails and what you're kind of hoping to achieve with that, that role and that platform? Yeah, right. Um, well, it's an, an amazing um, position, I yeah, because I travel all around Australia. I have, I, as Ch Australian Children's Laureate, it's a two-year appointment, so I go to every state and territory in Australia and I talk to children, I talk to um, I talk teachers, parents, booksellers, anybody in the children's book industry. And um, when it's a nominated position, and I was so I was so shocked when I was um, when I was nominated for this, um, I received the Australian Children's Laureate Foundation newsletter um, in, as an email, and once a year they ask for a don donation, and so. I wrote, um, sent them a donation of $25, and the very next day, um, I got a, a message on my, on my phone saying, um, this is Bruce Ellis from the Australian Children's Laureate Foundation, could you give me a call back? And I thought, uh-oh, what have I done? Haven't I given enough money? <laughs> I, I really thought that he was going to say, you know, and I was, had my answer ready saying, did you know that an author's um, only earn $14,000 a year? <laughs> but um, so I was really totally shocked and um, so honoured. So, um, and I had to choose a theme and I have many themes, but the most important theme for me is imagination. Because without imagination, um, what are we? You know, I mean, we are the only animals with imagination and uh, nothing would be invented, rockets to the moon, electricity, whatever, without imagination. So that's what I want to stimulate children to use their imaginations and not to forget them and to remember that imagination is free. You know, it's, it, all you have to do is exercise. It's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. And it's so important for us to use it. Now, the other, th the other thing that I talk about is diversity, to read a diverse literature by diver about diverse characters written by diverse um, authors, and that's what I think is really important. Um, because when I grew up, there was nobody, you know, I mean, I wasn't, Chinese people weren't even, there was no protagonist who was Chinese. Um, you know, usually it was some comedic character or light-hearted sort of, um, and it was like, for example, you know, I think of Breakfast at Tiffany's, um, when you have Mickey Rooney as a Japanese, and it, you know, I don't know if you remember that, that, I mean, it's just horrific. It wouldn't be accepted today. So, um, so I like to go around. I think that as being an Australian Children's Laureate and being, having an Asian face is a really good thing too because it can help children um, realise that, yeah, hey, we all belong and we are all different and Australia is such an incredible country where we can all be accepting of each other. And I just wanted to say something about the... Um, you know, be the, the feelings and emotions. Mm. Because reading, I mean, a reading is the most amazing thing because it's the only thing, only art form, film can't do it, plays can't do it, where you can get inside the head of a main character. Mm. So you can get inside the head of a, of a child who has disability or an Aboriginal child or a child, you know, who is from a different culture. And so it's an incredibly powerful tool reading and it's you know we need to encourage more children to read more diversely yeah uh, it sounds like you're <laughs> doing amazing things with that um position and congratulations Thank on that honor um gary i wanted to um going returning to your book the boy from the mish one of the most um wonderful sort of and interesting things about your protagonist jackson is that he's you know he's aboriginal and gay and i think you know when we talk about people in marginalised identities, we often just talk about one aspect of their identity. We forget that we all contain multitudes and we all have overlapping identities. And, you know, and for Jackson, you know, these are both two really crucial things that coexist. He lives in the intersection of his queerness and his Aboriginality. Could you talk to us a bit about how those parts of his identity kind of interact? Yeah, well, I think for Jackson, he's... Uh He's very scared that once he accepts or like comes out as being gay, that's all he'll be is mm. the, the gay kid. Um, 
Yeah, like there's a little passage in the book where he's like going through all these different labels for himself, like the gay friend, the gay cousin. Um, yeah, and like he, he worries that that's just what he's going to be and mm. that means that he can't be connected with his culture and he can't be a part of these cultural groups and uh, yeah, be a part of that community in the way that he needs to be. Um, so really it was... I mean, that was all very much my own fears as well. So, um, yeah, it was really just exploring that, you know, those fears and, um, and yeah, just trying to articulate how that, that felt for me. But uh, at the same time, trying to paint a hopeful kind of uh, journey that, 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 yeah, being gay is a, is, a, is a thing, but it doesn't... It's not every part of you. Yeah, uh, yeah it's not your whole identity. It's, um, yeah, it's not your whole identity, um, as an Aboriginal person, he's yeah, he's very connected with that community and very much involved in that community and, and very connected with his culture and um, yeah. So I think by the oh, no spoilers, but um, I think by <laughs> the end of the book, he's kind of realised that um, that he is going to be accepted. Um, it's not a coming out book, so he doesn't really come out to many people in the book. But um, yeah, so it's more about him learning to accept and. And finally, come to that point in life where he, point in his journey where he's he's okay with it, and, and it doesn't change who he is, um, and he realizes that. Uh, but yeah, I was kind of oh my god, I was going on a tangent, and I forgot what I was actually going to say. Um, it was it was uh, yeah, it was coming to that point where he realizes that yeah, there are all these different different things that make you a person, and and yeah. Being gay doesn't mean that he can't be Aboriginal, yeah. and being Aboriginal doesn't mean that he can't be can't be you know, happy with who he is in his sexual identity. Um, yeah, I th- yeah, I really just wanted to hone in on that that um, that that fear and 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 that that worry that those two things cancel each other out. Um, and it, yeah, I mean myself, I didn't really understand, uh, you know how how kind of small that. That that clash actually is until I saw like Stephen Oliver on TV, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, doing poetry and on black comedy and um, yeah, it just made me like like Jackson just realise that there are all these other things that there are all these ingredients that make you a person and and none of them cancel each other out and it's all just about it's all just about being yourself and mm. and you know, living authentically and and because that's where the happiness comes from and the, the comfort in life. Um, yeah, yeah, the book's really about honing in on that fear and that worry and, and that journey for Jackson to to, to get to that realization that that he's okay with with who he is and he yeah and he loves who he is at the end of the book. Yeah, um, yeah. Which, but no spoilers. No, Everyone's going to go buy it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah I tried. Um, and Eliza, as we've discussed, I mean, your your book "Come Over to My House" focuses on disability, but it focuses on a number of different types of disability because obviously the disability community is, you know, as diverse as any other. I wanted to talk to you about um, the kind of the process of consultancy you did to, to write the book because it's clear from the end that you spoke to a lot of different people mm-hmm. about their experience and that informed the writing of it. Why was that important to you? Yeah, so I mean, all of these families in this book are real families that exist yeah, in the yeah. world. <laughs> and I guess this, in a way, is like the, the sister book to We've Got This. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of the people that consulted on Come Over to My House are actually in We've Got This, which mm. is an anthology of parents with disability. Um, so I wanted to make sure that this book was authentic and accurate. And so... Yeah, every single character has been consulted with um, a person that has that particular disability. The only character that wasn't consulted with is the character at the front here, who's a wheelchair user, only because I have physical disability and I've been a wheelchair user throughout my life. So, um, yeah, every other character, there's families in here that are autistic, um, families that uh, are blind... Um, a mother that's deaf, and inside the book you also get to learn a bit of Auslan Sign Language. Um, yeah, many disabilities, also invisible disability as well, because I wanted to show that it, yeah, you don't always you know, just see visibly um, a person with disability. 
And what was like the process like of working with an illustrator to kind of co-create the, the hard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Daniel Gray Barnett is an incredible illustrator. Worked yeah. on some of my favourite children's books, so I was really keen to get him involved. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that it was somebody that was diverse. So. Um, he is Asian and also is uh, identifies as queer, and um, it was a lot of back and forth of yeah. working with him, and it was so great that he was really open to what I had in mind. Um, but to begin with, I sent him like a lot of uh, photographs and um, made sure that it was like very accurate, and then we would just yeah go back and forth and back and forth. So that was. Yeah, one of probably the biggest process in a way was the making sure that it was visually portrayed in the right way. Yeah, well, because that's something that really struck me about it, that it's so visually appealing, but obviously a lot of thought and care has gone into the illustrations as well. Now, I wanted to ask each of you now, I suppose, about this bigger question of who gets to tell which stories? I mean, you're all kind of... I suppose each of you and me could kind of be characterised as doing sort of own voices storytelling, you know, telling voices as diverse people from, that are drawn from our lived experience. And, you know, we know that's becoming a kind of, you know, very um, popular model in publishing. But there's also been some backlash to that, this idea that, you know, when it comes to fiction and imagination, anyone should be able to tell any story and you don't need to kind of belong to that particular identity group. So I, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on this issue. I mean, do we want to stick with own voices storytelling or can anyone tell any story or is it somewhere in between? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, I'm in two minds. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, on one hand, I think that I own, you know, especially Chinese told stories. But on the other hand, I mean, you're right, you know, it's all about imagination. I guess it's a matter of the person getting, the writer getting things right. Yeah. Because yeah. so often you read, you know, I read with a Chinese main character and it's so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and it's embarrassing and yeah. it's not, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, I, I did this in a way um, with one of my books. It's one of the Our Australian Girl books, um, the Poppy character, and she is part Aboriginal and part Chinese. And I made her, because it's set, it's inspired by my great-grandfather, set um, around Waganya, which is the little town opposite Korowa on the other side of the Murray River. And that's where he was. Um, so I've sort of, you know, st stolen a, a bit of that, but I was very aware, and I haven't got any back, I haven't had any backlash, which I'm really happy for, about. Um, I was really aware that I could not tell... I mean, her Aboriginal mother had died at childbirth, mm. so she knows nothing about her Aboriginal culture, uh, but she's looking for a Chinese father, and that's what I could own. Mm. And she's put in a, a, you know, a, one of those homes. And I had... And I was made sure I got uh, Aboriginal advisor, so I got the um, um, Koori liaison officer from the um, library, State Library of Victoria, to be my advisor, every Aboriginal part was um, that I told had to go by her. And sometimes I put in some, some things about um, uh, um, the me, you know, wise men, the elders, and some of their wisdom, and she said, no, you can't put that in, you have mm. to take that out. And so I did. Um, and then I had um, Uncle Sandy Atkinson who also helped me with certain things. So I made sure that I got proper advice, because I did not want to be in a position where I'd be, you know, um, attacked, I guess, and it's been, it's been, it's been good. Um, it was interesting because Maxine, the career la liaison officer at the State Library of Victoria, she said, oh, it's very interesting that you write this because you're, you're not white, you're Asian, you know, mm. so it's a different perspective. So yeah, I can relate to the racism and all that mm. sort of thing um, firsthand. So, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what... Either, um, yeah, do you have I've, other perspectives on first, or? Yeah, I'll, yeah. Um, yeah look, look, similar to you, I'm very in two minds about it. Um, yeah, on one hand, I'm, I'm very much... Uh, like, I know that the books I read growing up, that Aboriginal characters are always very inauthentic and uh, we're always very secondary. Um, I think... Uh, 
Yeah, and I could tell that they were written through like a, a white person's eyes or um, someone else's eyes. Um, so on one hand, I'm like, yeah, like for so long, all these Aboriginal characters have been written by non-Aboriginal people. So um, nowadays, more Aboriginal writers are getting published. So it's time, it's time for us to tell our stories and own our stories. And um, but yeah, on the on the other hand, I I definitely feel like I think because. Yeah, Aboriginal people are very much a part of Australia, and and to tell, you know, to add that diversity in stories is very important, mm. especially if you're a non-Indigenous person. Um, but yeah, I think like like you said, just um, it really needs to be that 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 good solid uh, consultation and 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 you know research and and yeah, that means you know not just reading up on a website uh, some information, but actually spending time with Aboriginal people and. and Actively involving them into the into the writing process and for those characters and and I guess knowing and being open to knowing that that you don't know everything and and, and you will be wrong about things mm. and and um, yeah I guess like you just said um, you know being open to that that feedback and accepting that feedback um, but yeah I definitely I mean the, the way the way I fell in love with writing was from just uh, you know, imagining people who weren't real and, and, and yeah, just t letting my imagination take me to wherever it took me at the time. Um, so, yeah, this it is it is something I feel very kind of conflicted about in terms of what I say. Um, because, yeah, I definitely feel uh, if, if you are a non-Indigenous non person, you can include Aboriginal characters in your book. Um, but, yeah, it's just as long as you get that the consultation right and 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 tells tell and yeah write authentic characters that that are um, true to the mm. to the way Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture actually is um, you know rather than honing in on those stereotypes and 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 you know those I guess those negative portrayals that were always in the media you know, up until nowadays. Um, yeah. So yeah, on one hand, I'm very much like Aboriginal people have been silenced for so long, so it's our turn to to tell our stories. But on the other hand, I'm like, yeah, we need more diversity in in, in books by non-Indigenous people. So um, I'm definitely advocating for more, yeah, more, yeah, stronger consultation. And and as long as I think as long as you get that consultation right, and and you actively involve Aboriginal people into the writing process, and and create authentic characters, I think you'll be good. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, thanks. This is a hard no, that's, yeah, it's a complex issue, so that was yeah. a really, really thoughtful answer. Thank you. And I'll did let, you yeah, want to add anything? Tiny yeah. interjection. Um, I would just say that, yeah, for, for so long when non-disabled people have written about disability, it's often seen as a tragedy yeah. or as an, you know, inspiration kind of story uh, instead of it being authentic. But I wouldn't, as, as you said, I wouldn't want authors to shy away from having yeah, a yeah. disabled character because, again, that's that great representation as long as consultancy happens. Uh, but I just wanted to also speak to the fact that I co-wrote this book uh, and the reason that I did that was, I guess, it was like <laughs> I had the idea to create this book and went to Sally Rippon with the idea. And Sally's a good friend of mine and she's written children's books for a long, long time. She's written the famous Billy B. Brown series, Polly and Buster series, and, you know, so prolific. And for me, it was kind of like that real combination of somebody that might not know a lot about disability but can really speak to children. And, and me, as, a, as someone that has the lived experience, that, and then those two kind of forces come together. Yeah, and we, yeah. it was a very co-written book. Like, we just really... The whole process was completely... Together. Yeah, so you right. had like complementary expertise. Yeah. yeah. We just yeah. went back and forth, line, line, and just would write it together. And it was very, I feel like that to me feels very like the future where somebody that's a disability ally, that, you know, she has a child that is, is just started to identify as having a disability. And it's like two people, you know, just being together and coming together as, as a non disabled person and disabled person. Yeah. To me, that was a great marriage. Yeah. Well, I think maybe that's a wonderful note to end my, my questions um, on. Um, we'll turn now to audience questions in the minutes remaining. Do we have any questions floating around? Oh, there's one over here.
this here. How did you get the courage? <laughs> I wanted. Is that for all this, all the authors? Yep. Wow. <laughs> That's a good no, question. How did you get the courage? Um, the courage? I would say, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just, uh, I mean, me, I was always the oldest sibling, so I kind of had to take on that role model role anyway. Um, so yeah, I just, I just always wanted to lead by example for my younger siblings. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I just had to force myself to be courageous, I think. Yeah. 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 Great answer. Did either of you want to? No, I don't really have it. I, how do you get the courage? That's a really, it's a fantastic question. I just, it's so, yeah, it's so complex <laughs> and it's, even though it's so simple. Um, I think that you just, uh, you know, if you do suffer from, um, you know, racism or, you know, or abuse in some way, that um, it's a matter of having something in you, in you that, I suppose it has to become hardened in a way. You yeah. have to become hardened. You can't be too soft because you'd be too hurt. Um, but you can't be too hard either. So otherwise you don't get the courage because you'll be too hurt. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's probably getting that balance and having, having mentors, yeah. having a mentor, having a person who can advise you, somebody you really trust, and having friends who are really, really supportive. I think that that's really important. Yeah, yeah I was, I was going to say exactly the same thing for me. It was, it was having some really hard times throughout my life that then made me become very passionate about what I was constantly seeing in the world and the ways that we could make some really simple changes. Yeah. So it was like that that's where my courage came from. Um, also, you know, having role models as well, like um, Carly Finlay, who's a, her gorgeous mother's here today. Carly's, you know, been a big influence in me. She's a, a proud a disabled person and was great just to have someone that I could really learn from and have that role model and know that what's possible in the world. And again, also having kids was a, a, a mm. became really a way for me to... I wanted them to see a mother that was truly her, her, like herself and authentic and I didn't want to hide anymore. And so the courage came from having kids that I wanted to model that for them. Yeah, great answers to a great question. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Yeah, one here. There's a... Yeah, really, really, I've learned a lot in this session. Um, everyone's using the word authentic. I'd just love you to unpack what you mean by authentic. Uh, for me, authentic is being honest and um, being myself. So, um, Yes, even saying the word disability, because again, as a child and growing up, I really feared that word, because it was often portrayed as something that was like a tragedy if you had a disability. So that made me not want to be myself. So making sure that yeah, I'm honest and being, being, speaking truth. And when I speak about being authentic in this book, it's just making sure that again, it's authentic and real and based on true lived experience. I agree. What you said, yeah. Do you want to add it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, just... Um, okay. I'd be curious to see what that word actually yeah. is in the dictionary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, the only thing I'd add would be, yeah, just telling the truth about how things really are and forgetting all those um, stereotypes and, mm. uh, yeah, the way stories were told before, um, just allowing those to fall away and, and get to the truth. Um, I wonder if, if it means that you have to f have experienced that yourself to be authentic. Mm. Does it mean that? I mean, we, what does that word authentic mean? Because when I think about being authentic, I mean, every one of my characters, I've written 21 books, um, is part of me. Mm. Mm. And I guess that's being authentic. Because that's what I know. It's what you know and what you have experienced. Is maybe, maybe the audience has a different... Uh, thought about authenticity or being authentic. 
a big <laughs> deceptively <laughs> simple yes. question. And I've got another question here. Um, so I'm also a Chinese Australian children's book author. So part of me, of course, loves the fact that Gabby is the children's laureate, and I love to see that representation. Um, and you know, seeing people publishing books about different backgrounds. And my dad and I are both very, very, very big readers, and so he's always texting me pictures of book covers of other Chinese Australian authors who've been published. And so part of me is very proud of that, but I'm interested if you have this conflict as well, in that part of me sort of wants to push back a bit and sometimes say, why can't I just be an author? Why do I have mm. to be the Chinese Australian author? Why do I have to be the Indigenous you know, LGBTQI author? Why do I have to be the author who writes about disability? Why can't I just be an author on my own panel as an author in my own right, not somebody who's here, um, you know, defined by my specialty? So I'm interested in how you guys manage that. Because we don't call some authors the white, straight male authors. <laughs> we just call them the authors. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, for me, I don't think I'm defined as a Chinese-Australian author. Mm. Um, I think people say Gabriel Wong, the children's author. Um, but personally, um, when I first wrote my first book, because it's basically uh, um, about how I felt fitting in as a child and, and growing up like that, um, my character is Chinese. And then the second book I wrote, because I was born in Australia, I'm a true dinkum, fair dinkum Aussie, and, you know, and I felt like I was white inside when I, I was a banana, you know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside, because I grew up totally not knowing anything about Chinese culture. So with the second book, um, I thought, OK, the main character can be a white, a white and, and she is, with a sidekick who's Chinese. And, uh, but then as I started writing more, I... I realised, and as I spoke to schools, I realised that children needed um, children of, for, who were different. I mean, or even um, teachers would come up to me and say, oh, I loved your book, I love what you said, because, you know, we were migrants and we've had the same experience. So there are a lot of people who can relate. And I think that by having a Chinese um, um, protagonist, I can help more people and more children because only by that can they get inside of the head of a child who is different from them. As I said, reading is that powerful. And so, um, so I think it's, yeah, Amy, I think for me that's the answer for me, yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, leading up to my book coming out, I, was, I had this moment of, I mean, I had many moments of panic, <laughs> but uh, one of the moments was, oh, I'm going to be pigeonholed forever and... and I'm only going to be able to write about gay Aboriginal characters. Um, <laughs> and then I, yeah, so I've kind of dealt with that and then, then I kind of realised that, you know what, I actually want to write Aboriginal characters. Like, I, all my main characters are going to be Aboriginal. I'm going to be telling Aboriginal stories and, and if the, you know, the publishing industry or whatever wants to put some label on me, then fine. Um, because, yeah, like you said, um, I think it's important for Aboriginal kids to be able to to find an Aboriginal author or, yeah, someone who's got that uh, kind of title. Um, so I, I definitely had that fear of, um, yeah, I'm only going to be seen as this one thing, but, but, yeah, maybe, like, the kids who were like me and wanted to find those kinds of authors when, when I was young, um, you know, maybe that'll make my kind of books or you know, other Aboriginal books easy to find for them. And, and, yeah, I'm really just kind of happy to own it now. Um, yeah, I, I, those are the stories I'm going to write. I'm going to write about Aboriginal kids and Aboriginal characters. And, and yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, you know, I can't control what, what people are going to label me as or anything like that. So I'm just going to own it. Because, um, yeah, that's, that's all I can really <laughs> do. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that now. Did you want to make No, that is exactly yeah. it. I just really want to echo what they said. It's exactly what I'm feeling. So there's not yeah. much else to add. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for any more questions. But um, thank you so much for being a fabulous audience. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, Gary, Gabrielle and Eliza will all be outside signing copies of their books. So you can, um, if you have any other further burning questions, you can say hello to them then. Um, 
I wanted to let you know we've got more great events coming up. Eliza will be back in here tonight for Stereo Stories in Concert, and I believe tickets are still available for that. I'll be back here um, tomorrow morning uh, talking about my memoir, All About Eve, Notes from a Transition with Matthew Ruby. And there's another greater event on in here um, in half an hour at 1.30 called Truth and Storytelling, which features Eliza Henry-Jones talking to Patty Miller and Lee Kaufman about memoir, friendship and the craft of writing. So do stick around for that as well. But please join me in thanking our wonderful panel for today. <laughs> <laughs>